My name is Glenn Pameo Smith. I'm the director of Hold at All Costs, a film on the Korean War. And you're watching Real Talk. So, Brock, when you left for the war, it's 1951. What was American society like? What was the atmosphere like at home? I think everybody was tired of the Second World War, and frankly, they didn't much care about what was going on in Korea. As I remember, uh, uh, patriotism stopped at the bay in San Francisco when the ship sailed out. Boy, that was the end of the patriotism. It was, nobody really cared. What about when you got back? Uh, same. I was met in Oakland by a customs officer. He just wanted to know what I brought back from Japan. Wow. These men and women, the mash nurses I, and, and the Chinese, they all said that when they got home, uh, they would be invited to a party and uh, they would be drinking or whatever. And somebody would say, where have you been? You've been to Korea. Tell us about it. And they would only one time describe the horrors of killing 100 people, 80 people, whatever it was. And the shock on the listeners' faces, they could sense that this was not necessarily a good thing because next week you were not invited to the next party. Wow. And so you learn very quickly. You just shut up. You don't talk about it. <laughs> I mean, Excuse me? Do you think that, you know, is one of the reasons why, you know, you rarely see, you know, documentaries about the Korean War. I mean, aside from this, I, yes. I rarely hear of any. Um, what do you think is the reason for that? I, I can only go from what I heard. And um, what I learned was uh, this was not a definitive war. This was not, we beat them, look at the trophy, let's put that trophy on a shelf. This was a war that was just kind of fizzled, probably like all future wars. There, there won't be a definitive battle, it'll just be a settlement. And so you had, maybe perhaps in the first time in our history, American history, U.S. history, a non-definitive battle, a, a war. And so, in my opinion, uh, this was new to the American people, so let's just forget about it. And the sensitivity in, Japan, in uh, Korea and in China is the same thing. Let's not really divulge this, and so we keep it quiet. And this film, hopefully, will re-examine um, that war as no other film has done. I want to ask you, how has your movie been received around the country? I like to think of my movie as really putting a face on not just this battle, but the entire war. And if not just that entire war, perhaps an entire generation, the sacrifices of that generation. By examining this one battle, we put a face on maybe the whole conflict. And maybe there's related to today's uh, uh, things that young men and women are being asked to do in, in the Middle, Middle East, perhaps. The film aired on, uh, nationally on PBS uh, during the Memorial Day weekend, and I received over 400 uh, responses. Now, that could represent millions of other people, or hundreds of thousands of other people, that didn't write. And the, the heartfelt thank you from usually children and wives, uh, grandchildren of these men and women was uh, really, they had no idea what, what this generation has done. And we, we are coming to Korea, and we're going to 16 other countries with this film over the next year. And uh, I think the world needs to re-examine this really, really unique thing that happened in this region. And today, we have peace in that region. I think you can point to sacrifices that men like Rock Lippitt did. And 60 years later, those dividends are being felt today because of that commitment 60 years ago. One of the things that you mentioned earlier was how you were organized in each company. So each company or each regiment would have a katsuna? Katusa. Katusa. Those were Korean soldiers that were in the South Korean Army, and they were assigned, a lot of them were assigned to the American divisions. And uh, say we'd have in each squad maybe uh, 12 men, and then we'd have five katusas. And, uh, they were good soldiers. Did they speak English and were able to communicate with you? We had used some of them as interpreters, and uh, we, they could understand, some of them could understand Chinese on the radios. So we used them that way. We used them artillery. Uh, they were very valuable. You know, I heard that there was a Korean War Veterans Association um, 
and they're doing a project uh, to tell America, to, to, to inform Americans about the Korean War. Um, what do you think about projects like these? I haven't participated in those groups because I, I frankly don't like to talk about this. Mm -hmm. And uh, consequently, as Gwen said, for 60 years, I just shut up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to work in an office and brokerage firm, worked with a guy for 12 years, and he never knew I was in the Army. out of Kunsan. I was stationed at uh, Piengi Tongdae Moon. It's a very difficult time to go to the country. There are many people who have come to the country. We've been here for a few years. 이렇게 한국이 자랑스럽게 번영된 그 모습을 한번 보여드리고 싶고 또 그분들이 조금이나 막 이렇게 위안이 될수 있는 We have a social gathering every month. I'm very proud that he was a part of getting everybody democracy. I admire what the Korean people have done. Your, I mean, your, your country is incredible. How many American soldiers had died during the Korean War? My records show about 36,000. So 36,000 American soldiers died over a course of three years. That's a lot of lives at, that were sacrificed. About um, 100,000 wounded. And 100,000 wounded. So this is all for a country that nobody really knew about. I mean, how did the Americans and how do these soldiers feel now about having served a country that literally was a completely foreign place? It was to stop communism spread. I think Brock's just opened a door. If you think about World War II, it was fascism and Hitler mm -hmm. and, of course, Japan, the spreading of, of, of fascism. And the world was called on to stop that. A few years later, we have a new menace, communism. Mm -hmm. And the first line of the test was in Korea. Uh, the allies of the, of the world should have stopped Hitler right at Poland. But as you know, we didn't, and it just kept, it kept going and going. It wasn't going to happen this time. We hold the line. Let's hold at all costs in Korea, a little country not too many people knew about. But that's what makes it monumental. And it, it, it was a statement that we did hold them. And we maybe had stopped the next world menace. In fact, look at today. We've got a, the fall of the, uh, of the USR, USSR. We have uh, China has redirected their energies from the Stalinistic marching communism to the largest capitalist country in the world. It's all because of direct result of this generation. What was it like for you when you came home? I was certainly glad to be home, but I, I went back to college to finish. I wanted to finish college. That was my sole purpose in life. That's kind of uh, a lot of Korean purposes. Like our, our parents just drill us to go be educated, go to college, and you know, um, well, I figured there was a better way, because mm -hmm. when I got drafted, we got, I think it was $87 a month. Wow. And uh, I'd go over and buy a couple of cartons of cigarettes, and that was that's that's all the money I had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I figured there was a better way. You go to college and get a degree of some kind. Brock, when you landed in Incheon in 1951, what was your first impression of the Korean people? Well, the uh, first thing I saw was a honey bucket going down the road. <laughs> and uh, you probably don't want to hear a description of that right here. But um, people were pulling 
buckets of fertilizer behind them. That that's how they fertilize their crops in uh, human waste. That's the first thing I saw. Now in Incheon, they have five golf courses where we landed. <laughs> and um, Korean girls sure can play golf. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some, they're real small, weigh about 110 pounds and mm -hmm. hit the ball further than any of us could do. <laughs> That's for sure. That's for sure. So when you got back um, from Korea, what was the first meal you had? I'm sure you didn't have good American food, you know, in the bases, so, or, you know, in Korea. So what was the first thing you craved when you got back? Do you remember? No, but I sure gained weight. I, <laughs> I went from, when I got back from Korea, I was in great shape. I weighed 163, and I went up to 220 in about 30 days. Wow. It was, I couldn't wear any of my clothes. <laughs> and um, I, I pigged out. <laughs> Brock, what do you think about Korea today? And I think it's absolutely marvelous. Um, look at a, um, a night photo of North Korea is all dark, nothing going on, no cities, no lights. South Korea's got lights, factories, making cars. I think it's wonderful. Does it amaze you, especially since you were there? And oh, I, I think it was worth it. For sure. What can you say um, to the people um, that want to do more um, in terms of learn more about you know this conflict? And I mean, just the idea of history is you know you got to learn from your past. You know what I mean? And and what would you tell the viewers that that want to do more and research more about? Um, the Korean War, and specifically, you know, the Battle of Outpost Harry. If I can answer this, um, I think I would be most proud that because of this effort in this film, you know, we had 16 United Nations countries fighting in this. We had China on top of that. We had, of course, South Korea and North Korea. If nothing else comes of this, we've all been touched by this. There's an uncle, there's a grandfather, there's a father, there's somebody in your life, in, in each of these viewers' lives, that have been, t have been touched by the Korean War. And before this generation is gone, and they're, they're dropping like flies, and I'm, I'm sorry to say it's, it's 60 years later, I, I would encourage young people to reach out and, and find in their own lives uh, to be touched personally of what that sacrifice was. And I think this nation and this world will be better for it. Thank you both so much for your time today. I've learned so much. No, thank I'm you. I'm so honored by your presence and by your service. Thank you. And like I said before, I mean, speaking with you has just fortified for me what it means to be Korean and American. And it's really just a pleasure to speak with you. Today we learned so much about the Forgotten War. And no longer is it forgotten in my mind, but really a war of victory. Thanks to Brock and Glenn and the many veterans who fought for Korea and for America, we're here today. We're all very blessed and I'm so grateful for their public service. That's right. I mean, regardless of your uh, political standings or whatnot, I mean, troops are fighting for us, for our freedom. And um, without people like Brock and, you know, even soldiers today, we wouldn't be here. So thank you guys so much. And hopefully you viewers out there understand that too. And so please leave a message on the website and see you next time. See ya. You hear me? A lot of guys that didn't do anything and were sitting in Tokyo and they, they do all the talking. So um, anyway, the real heroes are the ones that died over there.